Evening. It's me, Art Hostage. I'm back. Now, I'm going to read you some of the, the Chapter 3, um, Peter James and Graham Bartlett uh, book chapter about Brighton Knockers. And what I'll do is I'll tell you who the real people are. Okay, now this concerns a 170 carat sapphire that was stolen from Lady Stuart Clark at Dundas Castle in Scotland in 1980 by Bobby Barrett, Robert Bobby Barrett. After he stole it, he sold it to Tony Marjotta for £10,000. Tony Marjotta then got it recut to 159 carats, and they say in their chapter 59 carats, but it was actually 159 carats, and it was very, very smooth on the top and sheared off at the back. So then Tony Marjotta, having got it cut for 100 to 159 carats, gets it mounted in a huge diamond mount, which had like about carat diamonds or half carat diamonds surrounding it, almost like a miniature. He then puts it in the bank, and he now, um, in the 1980s, when it was worth about £60,000 trade and about £200,000 retail, he wanted £400,000 for it. And obviously, he got no one who would buy it for that money. Um, then in the 90s, when it was worth uh, £100,000 trade and £400,000 retail, Tony Marjotta wanted £600,000. Anyway, 1996, it's in his safety deposit box in Barclays Bank in North Street, Brighton. So I'm speaking to Simon Muggleton who was a detective constable uh, with the drug squad, who then got seconded over to the Brighton Art and Antique Squad, Sussex Police Art and Antique Squad, in 1989, when they formed this new unit um, run by Paul Grundy and Simon Muggleton. So I'm talking to Simon, and so he asked me to give him the background, and I tell him exactly what happened, and I explained to him that it's in the safety deposit box, along with uh, a Spanish miniature painting that Tony Marjotta had bought in 1970 for one pound um, and tried to sell to the Greenwich Maritime Museum in 1973 for 60,000 pound as long as they pay the tax on that because at the time I think it was 90% tax. They said no so then Tony Marjotta took the um, Armada painting to the Netherlands and it was in the Rijksmuseum from 75 to 1995 when he got it out. Um, when he died in 2001, Adrian, his son, Adrian Marjotta, didn't, was the executor of his father's will. He didn't declare the 159 carat sapphire. He didn't declare the Spanish Armada miniature. He also didn't declare a solid silver um, model of Bluebird, which um, Malcolm Campbell, when he broke the world speed record, was presented to him. Um, it was made by Asprey's. And in the two wheels, one of them had a, a, a clock in it and one had a barometer in it. Um, and it was all inscribed. Tony Fingers Wadey had bought it off of uh, Malcolm Campbell's chief engineer um, in the early 70s for um, £500. Sold it to Marjotta for £3,000. And Marjotta used to have it in his window in his jewellery shop in the 70s. But then he took it home and he had it on a... Um, chest of drawers in his bedroom. Um, plus there was bags of diamonds and, and loose stones and oh and there was a, um, a commode by the um, furniture maker Topino. There was a bow fronted um, secretaire bookcase that, that, that was had a maker's label inside um, that uh, originally, um, what was his name, Richard Windsor bought it in the east end of London for £300. He sold it to Dave Gore for £1,100. And Dave Gore sold it to Tony Marjotta for £2,200. Tony Marjotta took it straight home. It was worth 20000 at the time, uh, late 70s. Um, and then by the time he died, it was probably worth £60,000, £80,000 trade. Um, anyway, back to the Sapphire story. Yeah, um, right. So anyway, Simon Muggleton goes crashing in uh, with Bruce Spottiswood um, to the uh, Barclays Bank North Street. They unload it all. They get the um, sapphire, which is surrounded by diamonds in its mount. So then what they do is they then 
um, go and see Mark Barrett, which is the son of Bobby Barrett. And Mark Barrett had been an informant back in 1984 when he robbed the Coldwell McCrells down in um, Devon for Lord Nelson's Watch. Another story, I'll get on to that another time. Um, anyway, so Mark Barrett says to Simon Muggleton, yeah, my dad did steal that in 1980s, um, and um, your information is correct. He sold it for £10,000. Um, it came off a Lady Stuart Clark at Dundas Castle. So then Simon Muggleton then, then goes up um, to, flies up to uh, Dundas Castle. I don't think he took the actual sapphire, but he took a lot of high-definition photographs. He meets Sir Jack Stuart Clark, and unfortunately, Lady Stuart Clark had died a short time earlier. So he's in the room, and Sir Jack, he, he shows it to, um, the photographs, and Sir Jack Stuart Clark said, well, I can't be certain if it was the one from the bracelet. Um, he said, look, he said, that's where it is there. And he pointed to a painting on the wall, and there was Lady Stuart Clark with this bracelet on with a huge sapphire in it, right? Looked exactly the same. But he went, no, no, no. He said, I can't be certain of it. And you can imagine Simon Muggleton's freaking out, right? Don't reckon it at all. Anyway, back on the plane, down south, and then they do the other checking, and I'll do a lot of um, um, groundwork for them. I've got information off of Derek Hunt and a few other people, so I could track um, um, the Paul Store Silver Honey Pot was stolen by Graham Dorrington and was on pawn uh, at Marjotta's. What Tony Marjotta used to do was take all the identifiable stolen stuff and put it on his pawnbroking business and give the thieves some money to go on with so it could cool down and wouldn't be on display. Um, there was also a painting called the Red Glove that Daryl Aldridge had stolen and um, um, he sold it to Peter Ski, I think, and um, he put it on the pawnbroking down at Tony Marjotta, so there was loads of other stuff anyway. So they found all that was stolen, but they then had to give back the 159 carat sapphire to Tony Marjotta. So then we fast forward from 97, 98, 99, 2000, boom, June 2001, just before 9-11, Tony Marjotta kills over, he's gone. Adrian, not the sharpest tool in the, bo in the box, you know what I mean? Right, he ain't that bright. Um, and although having said that, he did go and live in Taiwan and he could speak fluent Chinese, which actually came in handy when he was negotiating for the Fitzwilliam Jade a few years later. But anyway, we, I'm getting sidetracked. So Adrian now, 2001, he's the executor to his dad, Tony Marjotta's will. So he tries to declare that the house in Tongdean Avenue, 51 Tongdean Avenue, is worth 600 grand when it was worth over a million. Um, and he says, yeah, ain't got nothing else. No, no, no. Yeah, jug and basin and all that. Signs off the um, signs off the probate. The minute he does that, he's broke the law because he ain't declared loads of stuff. So I thought, right, bastard, gotcha. And you'll know why. I'll tell you the story later anyway. So, boom, I ring up one of the, one of the top directors at the tax office and I'll say, boom, 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 boom. He's, he's the uh, executor to the will. Da, 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 da. It's okay. They get on to him. They go, well, right, Adrian, can you come in for an interview? So he comes in for an interview, shits himself. He don't know what to say. So all of a sudden he declares he has got the Armada miniature because of the evidence. He has got the 159 carat sapphire. He has got the all these other bits. So then all of a sudden they come can't um, agree on how much the um, uh, Spanish Armada was worth. And so he puts it in Bonhams with a £30,000 um, reserve on it, and it sells for £120,000. Well, after Bonhams take their commission, he gets £100,000 back. Well, he don't actually, because he owes 40% inheritance tax on that, takes him down to 60, right? Plus he owes fines for all the other stuff, and so that goes down to zero and some. Right. So anyway, so, so that's uh, so that was that done. Um, and now the sapphire. Um, I'm not 100 percent certain what happened to the sapphire. Or, um, I think we've lost track of it after about 2002. Anyway, so I just wanted to get the story straight because um, ironically, um, Peter James and Graham Bartlett used Simon Muggleton for their research. But obviously he gave him uh, Simon Muggleton gave him his version um, you know, sanitised and censored and all that carry on. I've got the real version, what really am. It'd have been so easy if they'd have come over to speak to me, I'd have told them the truth. And you know how much I would have charged them? Nothing. I don't charge anyone anything, you know, for all this. I mean, they give credits to um, someone they said from the seedy side of the antique trade, David Henty. 
Well, the truth is, David Hent, he'd done a little bit of wheeling and dealing and a bit out on the knocker, but was never really any good to it. His first love was painting, and he does paint. Yeah, he, he can copy any paint in you like. So to be honest with you, he was obviously very, very careful in what he said. Unlike me, I'll just go here, it all is. So anyway, um, yeah, so uh, right, let's get back to the um, uh, the chapter. Um, where are we now? Da, 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 da. Anyway, they're talking about um, uh, the Knocker Boys, as they became known, only had a rudimentary knowledge of antiques, enough to spot an item of value, but their game was to cheat people. A particularly pernicious trick was to carry a bag of sawdust in their pockets. On entering the house of an elderly person, they would furtively pour the sawdust on the ground beneath the piece of furniture, then warn the victim um, they had woodworms and offer to take it off their hands before it spread to all the other furniture. If an owner refused to sell any high-value items, the knocker boy would pass the details to a burglar who would later steal them and give the knocker boy a cut. Right, let's go back. Sawdust, no, it wasn't. What they used to do is they would have a handful of maggots that they would buy from the fishing, Jack Ball Fishing Shop down Edward Street, and they would open the piece of furniture, and if there were clothes in there, they'd sprinkle some wiggly maggots in there, and then close the drawer, and then they'd open it again and show the owner, and the owner would see the clothes being wriggled on by maggots and totally freak out, and that's when they could buy it cheap. If they couldn't buy anything of high value, yes, they would pass the details to a burglar, but the knocker boy wouldn't want a cut. He would want the gear. So he would say to the burglar, I'll give you a £1,000 if you go and steal this, 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 and this for me. And the burglar would come back. The, the knocker boy would give them a £1,000. Then the knocker boy would then go and sell it to dealers like Marjotta, uh, Tony Marjotta, or um, other dealers in Brighton who would buy stolen um, antiques. Or they would wrap it up and put it away and then maybe filter it through the auction houses because back in the 80s it was the Wild West. There was no checks or anything. So um, that's that sorted out. Um, some of these knocker boys graduated into a life of fake respectability, setting themselves up as bona fide de antique dealers in well-stocked shops in Brighton's famous lanes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, right. Now, here we go. Uh, However, this warren of Aladdin's caves had a dark side. It soon became the go-to place to fence stolen property. I was struck by the insightful 1996 independent news headline that proclaimed, if your antiques have been stolen, head to Brighton. The Sussex Resort is now a thieves' kitchen for heirlooms. 96 has been a thieves' kitchen since the early 60s. But anyway, right, so now what's the next bit here? Okay, for my days as a PC with Brighton CD amid catching rapists, robbers and burglars, I became very familiar with the vermin who preyed on the lonely, elderly and the vulnerable. The image of Ricky Moore, the slimy antique dealer in Dead Man's Time, is one I recognised immediately. Well, that's Phil Capewell. 53, balding, long, lank, grey hair, skinny white open neck, shirt undone to show his medallion, Cheap beige jacket, fingers adorned with chunky rings, booze-veined face and sallow complexion. But he knew how to charm his way in any old lady's house, no matter how canny she was. <laughs> that, that's Phil, wasn't it? That's Phil Capewell. Sponge mouth. <laughs> yeah, Phil Capewell. Like he's, first thing in the morning, everyone would go for breakfast. He'd be down the wagon, Church Street, for like four large uh, vodkas. Anyway, there may well be antique dealers who are lovable rogues. You have to laugh at some of their nicknames. Two-fingered Wadey. Well, that's it, Tony Two-fingered Wadey. That's true. Banjo Bannum. Well, that's Douglas Banjo Bannum. And the dude. The dude. Who's the dude? Never heard of anyone called the dude. Anyway, I suppose that's Peter James and um, Graham Bartlett just throwing in something there. But I've never heard of the dude. Anyway, for example, some will be straight with a genuine pa passion for making profits for themselves and they're grateful vendors. Oh, my God. But many are just crooks, plain and simple. No, 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 no. No. They're all crooks. Don't start all that bollocks about some of Mr. Straight and all that game. Cabbage, yeah, I'm Mr. Straight. Yeah, don't forget all that. Right, so what's this? Um, okay. Right, oh, here. Um, here, the, the heavy duty families. Um, oh, hang on. Yeah, the ruse relied on careful target selection, the ability to pass themselves off as experts, and the 
and of course, plenty of charisma. However repugnant the inner person may be, like Ricky Moore, well, like Phil Catewell, the knocker boy must come across to his target as a favourite son. Many were able to pull this off, but but several simply skipped the charm and relied on unadulterated violence and intimidation. Yeah, yeah, the, the heavy boys, the tie-up boys. Yeah, um, what was his name? Mark Rowlands, uh, Mark Barrett, Zaki Malheim. Um, what was the other one? That he, he, um, yeah, uh, 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 Small Z. Um, anyway, um, Darren Barker. Anyway, yeah, the heavy boys. They tie people and all that stuff. Anyway. Oh, Terry Biglow is described in Not Dead Yet as being from one of the biggest crime families in the city. Terry Biglow. That's Terry Boyle. We all know that. Olive. Yeah, Terry Boyle. Now, let me tell you. Terry Boyle first became a police informant in the very early 80s when Jack Snipe was um, in charge of the Art and Antique Squad. Now, Jack Snipe was not only an Art Squad officer, he was an amateur boxing referee. I was there in 1984 down at the top rank suite at a boxing do when Terry Boyle paid Jack Snipe £500 because he'd phoned him up the day before um, the police were going to come and raid Terry Boyle's shop, and I, along with Stephen Boyle, moved all the dodgy silver from the basement and all the yucky gear out the shop um, to somewhere else, and then when the police busted in 11 of them, the next day they found nothing, and for that favour, Terry Boyle paid Jack Snipe £500 in cash, 1984, in the top rank suite, boxing do, I was standing next to him when he did it, right, and Terry Boyle was, um, you know, had signed up police informant from then on, right, um, Terry Biglow is described, Terry Boyle is described in Not Dead Yet as being from one of the biggest crime families in the city, whose activities include protection rackets, well, I don't know about that, drug dealing, of course, and of course the illicit antique trade, well that goes without saying. Oh, and Maureen Boyle, the shoplifter, I mean she was a police informant, but with Brighton Uniform Police, not the art squad, because she was buying all the um, shoplifted stuff. And, um, and and she was getting deliveries, five, ten a day, and so they could have arrested her any time, but they left her alone. And I think when she got um, in trouble, she stuck in Tanya Mears, I think, to the police, and she got arrested. Anyway, um, protection rackets and, of course, illegal anti... Not a person to be messed with. No, Olive weren't a person to be messed with. Tell me about it, right? No surprise that the Boyles, or, well, the Big Lows, and the repulsive Smallbone family of which the hateful Amos is portrayed as particularly contemptible by James, had Brighton crime sewn up. Smallbone, well, I'd imagine that's the Mears, isn't it? The degenerate gambler, Victor Mears. Unreal. Do you know, one day he went over to see Mickey Openshaw and he paid him £50,000. And he said, Victor, give me 40000 of that and you can go down Sergeant York's and gamble all night with 10000 Victor, you know, um, not the bright, you know, not the sharpest tool in the box. He went, no, I want to take all fifty grand. So he goes down to this Sergeant York Casino and spends fifty thousand pounds in about three hours. Okay, gambling. He then goes home to his family and there's no food in the cupboard. As I say, a degenerate gambler. But anyway, so the small bone family they got to be the mirrors. Then there were, there were at least four similar families in my time in the Brighton C C CID. Well, I suppose that's the Douglas family, um, the Millises, the Mears, uh, the Collins. Oh, anyway, I can go into all them later. Their tentacles spread into almost any scam you could mention, and their reputation for extortion was notorious among would-be challengers, yeah, yeah, I ain't mentioned the Sanctons yet, don't worry, I'm going to come on to them, the South Coast Raiders, and had the old man Terry Sanson murdered, um, <clears throat> murdered them, uh, the security guard in the bus depot in 1961, charged with capital murder, right, which meant if he'd have been found guilty at the old bailey, he'd have been hung by the neck, but he got a not guilty, Three years later, he's on the bank um, on the great train robbery with uh, Danny Pembroke and his brother George Sanson, and it was Terry Sanson who coshed Jack Mills, not fucking Buster Edwards. Um, and then what happened? The reason that the Sanson and and Pembroke never got caught for the great train robbery was because they wore gloves, they had turtles on all through the robbery and all the time at the farmhouse afterwards. So they left no forensic whatsoever. Although Terry Sanson did give 50,000 quid back, which he gave to Freddie Foreman and he stuck it in a phone box so the police could find it because he weren't certain what they had against him. But years later, it came out they didn't have no evidence against 
um, Terry Sanson or Jules Sanson or um, Danny Pembroke. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, we were getting back to it. Um, yeah, their tentacles spread all around, right? Um, right. The antique squad was housed in a sweltering broom cupboard on the first floor of the imposing Brighton Police Station overlooking the Palatial and Airy American Express building. Its DS and four DCs held the most complete and sophisticated intelligence of every known criminal active antiques dealer and knocker boy in the UK. Yeah, you like this bit. Where is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Right, um... Right, one of the stars of the art squad, DC Nigel Kelly, well, no, that's DC Simon Muggleton, he was like a terrier. He would overwhelm his adversaries with a racing intellect and his awesome grasp and recall of every tiny detail. Mmm, some and some, yeah. Yeah, time when he went to Derek Hunt's house looking for two Lowrys, right, all of a sudden um, he said, where, are I, where is he hidden them? I went, I ain't going to tell you, am I? I said, because if you go straight to it, you fucking mug, you'll know it was me. Right, so anyway, bang, they go over, they raid Derek. He phones me up an hour later, Simon Muggleton. We can't find them. I went, oh, you fucking moron. I said, right, go back in now, but do another search upstairs and all that. But they're actually hidden under the cooker on the right bottom drawer. If you pull it out, right, there are the two pictures. Uh, all right, then. So like a cunt, he goes straight in, straight down in the kitchen. He goes, oh, can I have a look in here? Derek looked at him and went, yeah, I know it's fucking Paul done this. Do you know what I mean? Fucking, do you know what I mean, humbly? But I told Derek anyway, you know what I mean? Derek was my, was my main source of intelligence and he tried to fuck me over. And that's another story. When he sent si uh, when he sent Simon over and fucking Tic Tac. Oh yeah, Tic Tac, David Entignap, uh, Tic Tac. Yeah, he was one of the, uh, 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 of the registered informants for Sussex Police. Came over here and set me up. But anyway, that's another story. Right. So where are we? Right. However, in the early 1990s, the very existence of the Sussex Police Art and Antique Squad was in jeopardy. They, only knew, they knew only too well Brighton's knocker boys were venturing further afield. Pressure was coming down from the big cities for the squad to get a grip on its bad boys who were causing havoc far and wide. Oh, OK. Officers up and down the country started to target cars with Brighton registration plates and if they suspected a link to the antique trade, would order the occupants out of town. Questions were being asked. The squad needed a big result and fast. They had to prove their worth to those who were eyeing them up for the next efficiency saving. Right, where, where's, where's a bit about... Um, right, hang on. Da, 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 da. Where's the, the informants bit here? I, I was trying to find a bit... There was a quote here that I, th I think you would have liked. Um, where is it? Uh, the squad needed fast test. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. The squad's network of informants gave them access to around 30 grasses. No, it was 27. Simon Muggleton said in Crown Court, in the witness box, we had 27 registered informants that were Brighton knocker boys. And the team could rely on daily contacts from their snitches. Two in particular were so productive, so reliable that they were afforded agent status. Well, obviously, I was one. OK, right. Yeah. Paul Hendry, Turbo. He was one. OK, I had the code name of Ashley, uh, Mr. Ash, because um, I lived in Ashurst Road. Right. So they used to call me Ashley. And I used to speak to Carol, the um, uh, longtime secretary at the art squad. The other one, guess who it was? Terry Boyle, all right, it was Terry Boyle, okay, uh, right, and Terry Boyle and I were the only two that were afforded agent status, effectively on a retainer to gather and pass on information about Brighton's bad and bold, that was true, yep, yeah. right, now, where are we going, ah, oh, here we go, no, here we go, uh, right, Nigel Kelly, well, that's Simon Muggleton, right, right, was told about a huge theft in a stately home in the north of England, well it wasn't, it was Dundas Castle in Scotland, which had netted a legendary sapphire stone nicknamed the Plum, the fucking Plum, no it was never nicknamed anything, it was just a 170 carat sapphire, but anyway, he bragged that this gem set in a beautiful necklace, no it wasn't, it was set in a mount, like a miniature with, with about 20 half carat diamonds all round the outside, but anyway, was a fifth whopping 59 carats. Well, that's bollocks. It started at 170, and Tony Marjotter had it cut down to 159 carats. 
worth over a million pounds in today's money? No. It was uh, worth about a hundred thousand pound trade and four hundred thousand pound retail. Tony Marjot had wanted six hundred thousand. It might be worth a million pound now retail, but anyway. Da 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 da. Yeah, and he goes on to talk about when um, um, they go on to talk about uh, um, when like, when he took it up there and, and, and he refused to say it was mine. Well, I mean, how did he know? But the ironic thing was, there's a big painting I'll show you on Instagram. If you look on Instagram, the photograph of um, uh, Sir Jack Stuart Clark and Lady Stuart Clark, to the left of Sir Jack, you can see the painting on the wall of, of his mother, Lady Stuart Clark. She's wearing the, uh, the sapphire bracelet. Okay, well, I just thought I wanted to get that straight anyway with you. And, um, you know, we'll see how we go. Um, what's that now, then? Oh, that's 25 minutes. So that's sort of like half a podcast. Okay, so we can call this um, half a podcast, the um, um, Knocker Boys and Noblemen Sapphire Story, plus a little bit of uh, fluff around the edges. All right, I'll uh, speak to you soon. Oh, don't forget, yeah, there's bundles coming, honestly. Tony Connolly, oh, my God, Mamma Mia. Dave Bishop, Melvin, Melvin on his boat, and what? Oh, God, there's so much coming, do you know what I mean? I can't keep up with it. Anyway, I'll speak to you soon, and this is me signing off. It's, um, um, it's what is it? Uh, Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday evening, 23rd of Feb, 2022. And it's art hostage over and out.